Hi everyone, my name is uh, Maximilian Ambroise. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Heidelberg. So as I was introduced, um, I started actually in nanoscience, uh, more on an experimental side before moving on to chemistry and finally to theoretical chemistry at the, at the University of Heidelberg. So uh, I'm part of a EU network of a Marie Curie uh, innovative training network which is part of Horizon 2020. And cosine stands for computational spectroscopy in natural sciences and engineering. And it's about devising novel theoretical tools and computational codes for electronic structure theory and for the investigation of organic photochemistry. Just to plug my network here and to uh, satisfy the EU people who finance me. So what I'm interested in is actually sparse matrices. So sparse matrices are omnipresent in a lot of fields of computational sciences. And in chemistry, sparsity actually arises due to electron correlation becoming smaller with distance. Because I am interested in doing uh, computational chemistry with very large molecules, sparsity is very important to exploit in my case. And in the case of uh, chemistry, we have a clear block structure. So what we would like to do is actually just save those blocks which are relevant uh, to the computation and then just toss all the other blocks which are not relevant. There are different formats we can use. So there's also the uh, compressed sparse row, but for chemistry, it's much better to use the block, block compressed sparse row format. So uh, I have to admit I'm a C++ developer. Fortran was my very first language I learned, but when I came to Heidelberg, I had to learn C++. So uh, the first libraries I have used were in C++, like libtensor, tiled array, and the Cyclops tensor framework, but they proved to be insufficient for my needs. So I turned back to Fortran and I found a nice library called dbcsr. So dbcsr, the distributed block compressed sparse row library, it was the best suitable candidate for my needs. And it's uh, developed by the CP2K developer group, which uh, a lot of people are actually based in Zurich. So they are present probably here at the conference. So hi, everyone. And what's nice about DBCSR, it's MPI and OpenMP parallel, and it can exploit NVIDIA and AMD GPUs via CUDA and HIP. So the best part about DBCSR is that it can can do calculations with very small block sizes, which it was necessary in my case. And it's written, written in Fortran 2008, which uh, with a few technical, technical specifications from 2018 sprinkled in between. And it's uh, open source and available at GitHub. I really advise you to check it out. So I will show you an example of how the tensor contraction looks like in Fortran. So we would like to do this tensor contraction where we have the two input tensors and an output tensor C. In Fortran, we set it up with type dbcsr t type ABC, and then we call some functions to create them and fill them. And we can contract them by calling the dbcsr t contract functions, which takes those arguments. So we have the alpha input tensors, and actually how it's contracted is dictated by the uh, contract and not contract arrays and the map one and map two arrays. So this shows which indices are contracted in the first one, which are not contracted in the first one, and so on. And finally, how the in indices of the final tensor of the output tensor maps to the different indices of the input tensors. So I found myself um, faced with the problem that I wanted a C interface for this, because there was a C interface for the matrix uh, multiplication stuff, but not yet for the tensor contractions. So this is exactly what I did. And um, in C, the tensors are actually expressed in our case as void pointers because the tensor classes have, uh, the tensor objects in Fortran have some members which you don't want to use to access. So we chose to use void pointers. And in C, uh, we are not using the C, uh, CFI descriptors, but just simple pointers and array sizes. And then we can, con can call our C DB dbcsrt contract function. And uh, we also have to pass the sizes of the individual arrays, which uh, bloats the function a bit, but it's just how the C Fortran interface works. 
And what uh, bothers me a bit is that we have to pass a lot of null pointers because we have a lot of optional arguments. So I um, continued the whole thing and I actually wrote a C++ interface to the C interface, uh, which is also templated. So we can uh, declare our tensors with, the, with integer templates uh, to uh, specify the dimension. And then we can also specify which container, so which type they use, so double float or complex, whatever you want. And to solve the issue with optional arguments, I'm actually using something called named, um, the named parameter idiom, where actually contract is a class and then we call the individual class members to um, specify the input parameters to the function. And alternatively, you can also use a Einstein sum uh, notation, which I have written for C++. So it compresses everything even more, and then you can get rid of the uh, bit more ugly C version. So this is a structure. So it's everything written by hand. And um, at the very top level, you have your contract class, which has a member called perform, which you can either pass a string or not, whether you want to use the Einstein summation or not. And this calls a overloaded function, inline overloaded function, which includes the, um, the type which we need to call, which then calls the extern C function, which then calls a Fortran C API function, which then converts all the C, um, C variables to the uh, necessary, it converts them in a necessary form and manner. And it finally calls our contract function at the very bottom. So for this, you have heard it uh, in a few uh, presentations beforehand, so I won't go too much into the detail. We use the ISO C binding. So we have your subroutine CDBSR T contract D, which then um, calls the underlying contract uh, function from the DBSR Fortran library. And you can actually uh, have to go to the individual variables of those, uh, of those functions and then you have to see whether they are interoperable, yes or no, and then you can take different choices depending on what they are and how to interface them. So for example, are they interoperable, interoperable? yes. Are they an array, no. So for example, for interoperable types like double and float, we can just immediately pass them to the subroutine. And for arrays, we actually need to be aware that we also need to, to pass the size of the array and that the array needs to be allocated beforehand. We have a more, it's more problematic for strings and booleans. So booleans are actually not interoperable. So you need to convert them. Uh, the same type, the same thing is the case for strings. And actually if they are neither string or booleans, we use C pointers. So we can call CF pointer and then just pass the Fortran pointer. Uh, and then for intent out, it's again different. Uh, it's more or less the same for interoperable types, but we have to differentiate between Boolean strings and then pointers. So you can have a look at, at it later if you want. I have uploaded the presentation, so I won't go too much into the detail. So just to have a look at it, so interoperable types, for example, double or integer or long, long integer, which is a 64-bit integer in Fortran, they can just be passed as is to the Fortran interface. And the same more or less is the case for arrays. But we need to, of course, um, specify the size of the arrays beforehand. And then uh, both of them can also have the optional um, uh, attribute. That's why we need the technical specification from 2018. So we can pass them directly. Uh, yeah, just uh, as you have probably heard it beforehand, we can't allocate arrays in C and uh, deallocate them in Fortran because that in most cases gives an error. Actually for the GNU compilers, this is actually valid. This actually works, but it's not really recommended. And ideally we should know the array size in C before passing it to Fortran. Uh, but that's not always the case, and that's where we actually use the CFI descriptors, but that's not the case in our interface, so we haven't used the CFI descriptors. 
Uh, for non-interrupt types like the tensors, we are actually using pointers. So we are accepting a C pointer and we call CF pointer to associate them with Fortran and then we can pass them to the subroutine. And of course, if they are optional, we have to make sure to, to make sure that they are present and then only call CF pointer before passing them. Uh, there's a problem with optional non-interoperable interoperable types. So for example, if uh, we have a um, variable called pgrid, process grid, and this is actually an intent out. So this is actually gets allocated in the subroutine and then it gets passed to C. But the problem is if we just pass pgrid as is to the function, it's a null pointer here and then it actually assumes that the variable is there and then it will actually do something with it. So we need actually um, to divide it up into an if else tree. Um, so we need to make sure if the C pgrid one is present, but not the other one is present, then we all only call the function with pgrid one. And then we need to differentiate all the other cases. Uh, we have written a script which actually generates those if else trees automatically. So you can look at that later. And then the final subroutine for C looks like this. It's a bit more bloated, like I mentioned before, but that's necessary. And then um, for templating, because we can use different types for this, we are actually using FIP, a Python Power preprocessor, which you will probably hear a lot more uh, in the next presentation too. And then we can do the same for our C interface. So we uh, tell the compiler which types there are, and then it will actually generate them for us. So we have float, we have float complex, and double and double complex, and so on. And then uh, we can actually do the same for uh, actually in the in the header file, so the FIP processor is not only for Fortran, but I'm actually also using it in my project for C++ because it's very useful. And then we can actually use the same stuff in extern C and then um, declare our functions there and then also declare our inline functions to, uh, to have overloaded functions. So we can, uh, don't have to worry about the suffixes, but we can just call the contract functions immediately. And because this is a Fortran conference and not a C++ conference, I won't go too much into the detail about how I did it with templating. But if you are ready to uh, walk through the nine circles of templating hell, you can get actually something very nice uh, where we can declare the tensors with templates and then we can actually use uh, named parameters, named parameter and named constructor idioms which are very nice and in my opinion, very clear about which variables go in and which don't go in. It, um, it has a lot of curly braces, but if you're a C++ developer, you're probably not afraid of a few more curly braces. And yeah, so you can have different constructors like create and create templates and then pass the other variables with, uh, uh, by calling class members. And then, as I mentioned before, you can call a contract class, which you can also pass some optional arguments like move or look for both. And then you call the perform functions to finally um, do the contraction at the end. The c interface is available at CP2K DB CSR. And uh, the C++ interface can be seen at my uh, project page called Megalacam, but it's a work in progress. It's not ready yet, but just so you can see how I did the templating. And at the end, I want to be able to compute excited state properties of very large molecules with the power of Fortran and C++ combined. And if you have any questions, here is my email. And you can, of course, uh, mention, uh, contact me in the Slack chat too. Uh, just some acknowledgement. Acknowledgements, thanks to my prof, so my supervisor, Andreas Dreuf, and his research group in, uh, at Heidelberg University, and my second supervisor at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, and of course, the whole COSINE network, and the European Commission, which financing, which financing my PhD. And last but not least, Alfie Lazzaro for, for mentioning the Fortran conference and um, practically invited me here, and Patrick Sewald for helping me a lot out for developing the C interface for DBCSR. And that's it, and I'm ready for questions.
Thanks a lot, Maximilian. So far, I don't uh, see any questions. It's wait. Maybe one question to start with. So, which speed up? So, you mentioned your long term project of uh, calculating excited state properties. Yeah. Which speed up do you uh, exp uh, expecting? Are you expecting when using DBCSR for this goal? Uh, well, there's, so the excited state methods I'm using is ADC, so the algebraic di diagrammatic construction methods and which scales with n to the power of 4 at the moment with molecular size. And what I expect if I use uh, sparse tensor algebra and some other nifty tricks, I can get down to cubic scaling in uh, the most ideal case, but it's still, um, I'm still not really ready to test it and it's still in a very early stage at the moment. Okay, then. then we have another question. If you could please explain a bit about the nine circles of template hell. <laughs> <laughs> so um, templates are very nice, but uh, I mean, I, I've seen now that the Fortran community wants some template, but just a, a, uh, maybe a word of advice, like you can uh, take templating too far. And that's what C++ has done in my opinion, where you have like some, um, something called substitution failure is not an error, error, so it only compiles when the substitution is uh, successful, and then you can use some conditional templating, which allows you to call different uh, functions depending on how the templates are initiated. And it gets really, really difficult, and a lot of the tensor libraries I wanted to use for C++ had the problem that they were quite well uh, equi equipped with templates, but they weren't really doing what they were supposed to do. So it maybe distracts a bit from the task at hand. Okay, thanks. And then um, another question about uh, why introducing templates in the C++ C++ API if the Fortran API is general, meaning not having type-specific implementation. Uh, they, um, they do have type-specific implementations, but that's taken care of by the uh, Fortran uh, preprocessor. Uh, and uh, I mean, what I could do is like, as you have seen, I, I could do overloaded functions, but I just decided that I wanted to use a more C++-like uh, type um, of uh, coding it by using templates. It may be not the uh, most intelligent uh, thing to do, but I wanted to do it because it looks nice and it actually um, is also e easier for users in my group to use because they are used to templates and because I'm the only real, really Fortran programmer in my group. So I have to make sure that it's C++-like, as C++-like as possible. 